Welcome to the world united. Welcome to the world united. Hello to everyone live stream as well and welcome to session 3 of today which is interfaith unity and spirituality. And uh, as we go um, present each of the people. So we've got four people on the panel. And what happens is each person does a 10 to 15 minute presentation. And then at the end of the four speakers, we have a wonderful opportunity to have an open panel and live question and answers. So I'll start by introducing our first speaker. And uh, what we'll do is while because we're live streaming and the image that goes to live stream is responding to whoever's camera makes the noise so just in this beginning section when you're not the key speaker if you would put it on mute that would save you popping in and out of each presentation so chris you can leave yours on off because <laughs> you're about to i'm a, you're up first and uh, i'll introduce you now so chris parnell wonderful to have you with us today Chris has been involved in religious and spiritual publishing for over 40 years. He currently oversights several interfaith websites and manages content for five spiritual websites, including a website for interfaith, interfaith and climate change. He's maintained the religious, Religions for Peace Australia website for 12 years and also maintains the Multifaith Educational Australia and Multifaith, Multifaith Chaplain websites both of which are activities of religious, of religions for peace Australia. Chris has been engaged in religious and spiritual publishing in Australia, India, and has edited many books and several magazines. He's been a member and leader of multi-faith organisations for 28 years, has worked on spiritual guidance counselling with young people, and sees a future of cooperation, harmony, and understanding the emerging religions and culture in the future of humanity. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, Geraldine. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I didn't actually plan to have this background uh, today. It actually appeared, so I might as well explain it to you. I'm going to point, there's, that's the symbol for the Islamic religion. Uh, then we have the, um, I'm going to go try and get my pointing right. That's the Hinduism. This one up here is Buddhism. The one in the middle is the Australian Aboriginal Indigenous symbol for the sun, which is the source of life, the giver of life. Then we've got the um, the Jewish Star of David, the candor of the Sikhs, and uh, I've got a loom on my the cross of the Christians. Well, that one, that's right. So that's my background. I didn't quite plan to have it. Uh, thank you for your introduction, Geraldine. Uh, I have been in many spiritual organisations, but I was actually looking at some documents last night and I realised I've been writing for nearly 40 years, you know, in spirituality. And how I got into all of this is of interest to you is that I actually had an experience of the divine in another religion other than my own. And I already had baseline experience. So I, and I thought they were all a joke, to tell the truth. And I found out, hey, it's all real. And I had to explore it. I had to, because I had valid experience inside myself, I had to explore it. And this is how I got into interfaith. So what I'll do now is share my screen and share my slides with you. Give an introduction to interfaith and then also show you what's happening at Glasgow at the moment by way of interfaith activity and multi-faith activity and the religions at the Climate Change Conference. Okay. So we'll go to interfaith and climate change. I can push this button. Can you all see that? Thank you. So interfaith in climate change, I'm not going to read too much, but uh, here we go. Uh, oh, to go back. What is interfaith activity? Uh, we'll say interfaith activities where people of different faiths come together to build harmony, cooperation and understanding. Uh, that's in experience, how people actually experience themselves and their relationship and they share that relationship. That's what wakes people up. That's really powerful, right? So how does a diverse society function with a variety of people, cultures, and faiths of essential value? The energy to flow between different individuals and families and communities are what enable the whole to flourish with dialogue, mutuality, and respect. 
What is a wise society that values the spiritual well-being of each human being? This is a society which is firmly rooted in the traditional values arising from belief in the inalienable dignity of the human being, for which religious faith provides an underpinning, a foundation. Now, with interfaith, it's for people of faith, but it's also for people who don't have a faith, who don't who have no religious tradition, such as humanists and atheists. We respect them. So, what is free society which different perspectives are fully respectfully debated? Dialogue between religions is a crucial component of a free society. Dialogue between religious and non-religious people is also of fundamental importance. See, we have to respect the dignity of all people. All people have human rights. And we have to respect everyone, whether they've got a faith or not. They're human beings, and they may be living with human beings, which the Christian will also practice as well, or people of any faith. So stewardship, what's a stewarding society in which the divine gifts of creation are valued and safeguarded? This is a society which values and safeguards the created order and the relationship between human beings and the environment. It will give more importance to stewardship than to consumption. Now, this went awry in our times, and right now, the stewardship went over the board. And our times are now driven by the profit motive, and that's causing enormous problems for the earth. So we've got what have the world's religions said about climate change? We've got the patriarch Bartholomew, the Pope and the Archbishop of Canterbury did a joint statement a month ago. The Orthodox Church have got in there the Islamic Declaration on Climate Change, the Hindu Declaration, the Jain Declaration. It's very interesting reading the Jain Declaration. A statement by Echo Sikh planting trees the last 20 years. Buddhist, the Dalai Lama said the Buddha would have been a green Buddha. There are Jewish statements on climate change. A lot of the religions and faith, faith bodies have got into this and said ah, climate change is causing a problem for humanity. So the new interfaith declaration is called Science and Faith. 33 religious leaders signed this on the 4th of October in Rome with the Pope. There were Muslims, Ramakrishna, they're a Hindu group, Buddhists, Zen Buddhists, Confucian, Echo Sikhs, Taoists, Jewish communities, Imams. This grand Imam of the Al Hazar University, he's an important fellow. The last time the Pope wrote an encyclical, he got this fellow to release the encyclical. The encyclical was called We Are All Brothers. That's mind blowing. You got a Muslim, Muslim. One of the top Muslims in the world to release one of his documents is mind blowing. That's the Pope's commitment to unity of faiths and harmony among religions. So, what does this document that was released in Rome on the 4th of October say? It says we're one family sharing a common home. Nature is a gift. We are interdependent with nature. We want greater climate ambition from all nations. Creativity and commitment are necessary. There should be intergenerational justice. We should be good ancestors and leave the future worth living in for our children, our grandchildren, and our great grandchildren. Humanity needs to rethink the world we want. There are responsibilities and capacities. Um, the, all the religions are seeking a clean, green energy economy. And they're not fools who saying we're a religion and we've got a right, and you're wrong. They're saying, hey, we need to pay attention to what's happening on the earth at the moment. So the world needs to achieve net zero carbon emissions, take the lead in reducing our own emissions, limit the rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius, support vulnerable communities and nations that can't, that don't have a budget to, to deal with this. And the indigenous peoples, we need to pay attention to them because they have local knowledge. It's a little bit like the Australian Aboriginals when they do their burning of the environment. This is. Um, knowledge and wisdom going from thousands and thousands of years. They have local knowledge how to care for the environment. And we need to pay attention to that with humility. We need to respect them as well. So there are questions raised by this interfaith declaration. Can faith and science, climate science have a conversation? Can they talk to each other? Are the values of faith and science incompatible? 
Let's get ourselves this. Let's get ourselves this. Let this statement build harmony, cooperation, and understanding. Let's bring about human flourishing for our future. Let's outline the responsibilities and capabilities for everyone. And will it provide or inspire intergenerational justice? Will it create a future worth living in? That's a key issue. Though. So, what's been happening at uh, Glasgow? The Baha'is, they made an eco pledge. I've given a link there that they've got nearly 80 years of caring for the environment. They're a remarkable organisation at the highs. So they've made an echo pledge. Here's a, an interfaith dialogue on climate justice. So on the right, starting from the right, we have a, uh, the rabbi for Glasgow. We have a Hindu woman. We have a Buddhist lady. We have a Christian priest. The lady in the rose pink is the head of Interfaith Glasgow, then we have a Baha'i, this fellow's a Muslim, and the fellow on the end there with a laptop. Mm. But this um, Interfaith Dialogue on Climate Justice, when you dialogue with someone in another religion, it opens up something inside you, and you see things from another perspective, and that's very important. Here's an imam at the Christian church, St. George's Trong Church in Glasgow, reading the Interfaith Declaration to a community there in the congregation. Here they are at the end there and you can see they're from all the religions. So you've got the imam on the left, the woman there, people are holding various things. They've actually brought in a boat, the boat of humanity, to with the declarations in it. The lady on the far right at the front is indigenous. There's a bishop there behind them, Quakers, indigenous people. So a lot of involvement there, a lot of commitment. Here's Echo Synagogue. They're helping Jewish communities to go green. They're evaluating all the synagogues. But they're also giving strategies to Jewish communities all over the United Kingdom to go green, to live green. Here's Echo Shabbat. You know that the, the Jews have a Sabbath every, every Saturday, every weekend. So this weekend, there's an Echo Shabbat happening for the Jews and it's going worldwide. Very powerful. Here um, was uh, something run by the Interfaith Rainforest Initiative in collaboration with the Brahma Kumari Religions of Peace and the Government of Norway, listening to Indigenous peoples. One of the key things that came out of the Paris Agreement was that we need to listen to the Indigenous peoples about stewardship of the earth and care for the earth. We need to listen. So uh, that was a quite quite the session actually. It's available on YouTube. Here are the pilgrims that walked from uh, from Europe to Glasgow, fifty five day pilgrimage, and the Sikhs are at the front. You see the Sikhs with all their turbans on. That's because they gave a reception to all the pilgrims. And the pilgrimage was led by a Jewish fellow, and then there were Baha'is, Buddhists, Christians, Quakers, and Hindus and Muslims in the in the pilgrimage. Quite a crowd. They were received by the Lord Provost of Glasgow. Here's the Sikh temple, inside the Sikh temple. The fellow with the little hairy fan there, he's the Gurdwara or the priest. He's welcoming all the pilgrims to Glasgow. They gave the reception and a meal to the pilgrims. And then we, at the start of COP, they had an interbate vigil in the main square of um, Glasgow. So I'll go across from the, from the left. We've got an Orthodox bishop, a Catholic bishop, another Catholic actually, I think he's the Scottish Episcopal Church. Then there's the Catholic bishop. There's Sister Jayanti from the Brahma Tamaris. The lady in the green is the leader of Interfaith Glasgow. There's a Buddhist lady here. There's a Quaker lady. You see the imam with his white cap on in the background. Here's a Tibetan Buddhist nun. Behind her is the Lord Provost of Glasgow. The lady in the white with the shawl, she's a Baha'i. There's a Muslim behind her. And there's a Sikh standing there. So they all prayed. They all read prayers at the Interfaith Vigil in Glasgow last Saturday. Here's the crowd at the Interfaith Vigil in Glasgow. Uh, people from all religions there. Very good, very well covered. Now, one of the things you can do at uh, Glasgow is you can hold a press conference 
and a couple of organisations have done this. So I'm talking about the Interfaith Centre for Sustainable Development. They talked about the climate casino. Now, why would they talk about a casino? Because the house is the only winner in a casino. Everyone else loses. And the house, they said, is fossil fuel companies extracting fossil fuels from the earth. So they call it the climate casino. Everyone's a loser except the house. So they're, they're running another three press conferences in the next week. Then we've got this Buddha's Chu Chi Foundation. They've run two um, press conferences and then they run one today. Huge driving climate, climate sustainability. You know, they're really getting in there. Saying something. You can see that the different religions are getting in there and contributing to the conversation about why we need change on earth. So then there's video, they're videoing um, some of these sessions. So are religious leaders rising to the climate change? But these are side events, which the formal presentation is not on the main platform. And then the United Nations makes the space available. And this is part of the United Nations event. So now here's the biggest question. Now the fellow on the far right in the blue shirt, I know him, James Duckman. What they did was they, they threw a Fiji and they rode out to an island that gets flooded every day, high tide, there they are. They're saying, you know, no more fossil fuels, but this is what the future of the Earth's going to be like. We're actually standing on an island which is just covered in water. So, so that's uh, what the religions are contributing and why uh, the different faith religions are coming together to get a message out to not only to the climate change conference, but to all humanity that uh, we're in this together and, and you know, we really want the future to be a future worth living in for everybody. Thank you. It was really inspiring. Um, Reverend Chris Parnell, I greatly appreciate you bringing to us a, a, a very small slice of multiple peoples and pictures and viewpoints, all with the same focus of caring for Mother Earth, particularly at this time. I hadn't realised there was so much going on. And uh, to see it really did warm my heart because it's not necessarily what's reaching the mainstream media in terms of what was happening in Glasgow. But through seeing that, um, I, I even took some photos of screenshots and be wonderful if you, you felt you could share some of your presentation more widely so more of us can, can show the images of what's happening in terms of care and how there's that um, connection when we're all, the commonality is we all have this beautiful earth as our home, breathe the air and drink the waters. The, uh, the Spiritualist Union in the United Kingdom and the Quakers in the United Kingdom, they've, they've gone with us to chat about the Quakers. <laughs> they've really gone with it. But the Spiritualist Union, and then the um, I've got a website where I've got Indigenous peoples with a flag nearly as big as the entire square of Glasgow, and they presented that, that was their declaration, and they presented that to the president of the Climate Change Conference. Oh, my God. So uh, these people with different spiritualities have all rushed to, to Glasgow to give a message from the heart, from the heart for the future. And it's a very powerful message, I think. And it's previous, I've, co I've covered previous climate change conferences and there's not been so much contribution. This time it's just nearly overpowering, you know, how much. Um, I've got pictures of churches full of people praying for COP26. So, you know, there's a groundswell. And prayer is powerful. Prayer intentions, positive intentions, are powerful. They have a result. So I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you. Absolutely. And you're right. It does have a result. And, um, and it would be wonderful also hearing when we're up to the panel section to hear all of the viewpoints together. Now, I know we do have um, Pearl Waimara up next. And I just note that, Pearl, it's showing that yours is muted and it's saying ask to unmute i think from a phone from memory it might be star six oh you've, you've done it beautiful 